Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Exploring the Spatial Dimension with Mersco webinar hosted by Vision and Global Engage. We are very excited to have three amazing speakers for today. We will start with a 20 minute Vision presentation, followed by two Mersco customer talks that will be 30 minutes each. Please type your questions into the Q&A portal and we will go through them in the end during the joint 10 minute Q&A panel. Our first talk will be presented by Paul Rasmussen, our regional VP for Vision. Paul has over 25 years of experience in the biotech industry, spanning bench science, field applications, technical sales, and leadership. He has deep hands-on and commercial knowledge of the genomic space acquired through two decades at Applied Biosystems, Nanostring, and now Visgen. Currently based in Singapore, Paul is now responsible for overseeing Visgen's commercial build-out in the APAC region. Paul's talk is titled, Mapping the Future with Spatial Genomics. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. So Anjana, um, thank you. I, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview on the basics of MRFISH and MERSCO. Um, and then I'll hand it over to our um, key speakers of the day to actually talk about some specific applications that they've been doing with the technology. So just to get started, I, I probably don't need to talk to too many of you on this call about what the importance of spatial biology is. Obviously, there's been incredible amounts of, of data that's been generated over the last 10 or so years using single cell biology, but what's always been lacking is the context of that. So which neurons are interacting with which neurons, which um, you know, which tumor cells are, you know, being attacked by a particular set of immune cells. So all of that information, when you do single cell sequencing, you lose because you, you, you no longer have that, um, that two-dimensional context of where those cells are located. Now, uh, spatial imaging has been done for a long time. Um, single molecule fish has been around for quite a while, and there's a variety of other techniques. But the traditional challenge with these has always been that you're limited by the available wavelengths. So if you look at something like flow cytometry, I, I think I think the best flow cytometers right now are somewhere in the 40 to 50 plex, and, and they're using spectrum all the way from ultraviolet far into the infrared in order to actually get that many dyes. So to break beyond that, we need a different detection method in order to actually deconvolute what the, the locations and identities of our transcripts are. And that's where Murfish comes in. So if you take one thing from this talk today, I want it to be that essentially all we're doing is single molecule fish. We're doing it in very, very high multiplex, but it's still single molecule fish. And this is really important because it, it's a well-established technology that's very easy to design probes for. And as you'll see, that, that makes things very, very flexible down the road. We combine SM fish with a proprietary barcoding system. And this barcoding system means that instead of just looking at different fluorescent molecules, we're looking at combinations of signals being turned on and off to create this binary barcode that allows us to profile hundreds of, of genes uniquely, in some cases, thousands of genes uniquely. Um, and we do this in such a way that we're actually oversampling the number of bits that we would need to identify that transcript. Um, so the, the ER in, in MRFISH stands for error robust. Uh, we do such an, a significant amount of oversampling that we can actually correct individual mishybridizations if they were to happen. So take, for example, a, a degraded SFPE sample we could potentially um, miss one of the probes because there's a break over that transcript. Not a problem. The signal will be uh, recovered by using the other, the other bits um, to identify it. And because each of the barcodes are so distinct from each other, we really don't run any risk of misidentification by doing that. So Murfish has been around for quite a while. It, it came out of Zhao Wei Zhang's lab at Harvard in 2015. And since then has been adopted quite broadly um, in academic settings, um, mostly in the early days by people who were homebrewing the, the technology. So um, it, it's definitely something that a lot of people have taken on, but it wasn't, wasn't trivial. You know, you need people who are experts at probe design, at imaging, at um, you know, bioinformatics, fluidics. And so where VizGen came in was two of the members of Professor Zhang's lab created a company to commercialize this and standardize the hardware, the chemistry, and the software so that any researcher could get into spatial biology without having to have all of those you know, very niche domain expertise. 
and um, really let people just focus on the biology rather than spending all of their time developing the technology. And as a result of this, there have been over 170 papers um, excluding reviews so far using Merfish. Um, and this year, there was actually an inflection point where we're seeing more papers that are coming, significantly more papers that are coming using the Merscope platform, which is our instrumentation, um, versus people who have homebrewed that. The other thing I should mention about this is, you know, when you look at a lot of the bioinformatic algorithms that have been developed to understand spatial biology, um, a lot of them were trained on MRFish data because that's for a long time, that's all there was. And so, you know, that really ensures that we have high compatibility with, with a lot of downstream tools. So I mentioned that SMFish is, is, is a really, you know, fairly straightforward and, and well-characterized chemistry. Um, because of this, we have a very, very flexible platform. So we can look at hundreds to potentially thousands of genes and we branch beyond the traditional spatial spaces of just neuroscience and oncology by allowing people to customize whatever gene set they want. So while we have panels for you know, mouse brains, human cancers, and similar things, um, we're not solely um, dependent on that. You know, we, can, we can design a, a panel for fibrosis, we can design a panel for um, infectious diseases, for um, uh, you know, T reg cells, whatever you want, we can typically design a panel for it. Uh, in a cost-effective and, and straightforward way. And in fact, we've done this not just in human and mouse, but we've done it across a wide variety of species, including uh, you know, non-human primates, Drosophila, zebrafish, e even Arabidopsis. So we can, we've done plant work before. Um, so it really goes to show the true flexibility of the chemistry. Now, to really understand how Murfish works, there's three core steps to the process. Step one is the hybridization, step two is clearing, and then step three is imaging. And I'll walk through each of these in a little bit more detail uh, right now. So in the first step of hybridization, we actually have a pool of, it can be up to tens of thousands of probes um, that are in a single multiplex hybridization cocktail that we use to hybridize to the transcripts on, our, on the surface of the slide. You can see that each of the on the right, you can see that each of the uh, encoding probes actually has three different encoding regions. So each of these can, depending on, on the sequence context, um, either will be on or off in the presence of certain reagents. And I'll go through that in more detail in a moment, uh, but that's how we generate our, our, our bits of information. So multiple probes per gene, multiple encoding regions per probe. Now this next step, I, I think is really underappreciated and, and is really central to Murfish technology. Um, we first we do a gel embedding, and then we do a tissue clearing. So this is something for people who've been doing in situ hybridization that um, you know many many people are familiar with, but it's a very new idea to the genomics community. Um, basically, what we're doing is we are locking and anchoring the nucleic acids in place while removing any of the cellular debris that can cause autofluorescence. And and the reason this is important is. Um, an analogy I use, imagine if you're standing in a hallway, say 10 meters away from another person and you have a little tiny um, pen light. If you shine that pen light from 10 meters away, can the other person see it? If the lights are on, probably not. But if you turn all the lights off, you can very, very clearly see that. And now imagine you have, you have two spots of light and you wanna basically, you know, and they're very, very close together. Uh, again, you can see two small spots distinctly if you had to use a much bigger flashlight because there's a lot of, of light in the background, you, you wouldn't have the ability to resolve those tightly packed spots. And so by doing tissue clearing, we actually avoid the need for signal or, or enzymatic amplification that, that's common on a lot of the other platforms out there for doing spatial profiling. Um, now I will say this, you know, there, there's an argument to be made that, that we uh, destroy the tissue but um, you know, that often ignores the fact that we can actually do things and we do routinely do um, cell boundary staining and um, you know, DAPI staining, as well as potentially um, protein co-staining up front from this assay. So you still have the ability to do broader applications than, than basically uh, MRFish as well on the, on the uh, samples. Now, the last step is the imaging. And so we use basically multiple rounds of of um, reagents, which contain uh, fluorescent labeled oligos that are complementary to some of the bits 
on the actual um, transcripts that are, that are hybridized, um, you know, the hybridized encoding probes to the transcripts. And the reason I say some is because we want some bits to light up and some bits not to. And that combination of on and off for each of the probes for each of the genes gives us that unique barcode. So say, for example, we um, are doing cycle one, you know, we, on the left, you can see that we have some of the spots, um, some of the molecules light up, some don't. And so if it lights up, it's a one. If it doesn't light up, it's a zero. Um, we then repeat that for the second position. And if we get a signal, that's a one again. If we don't get a signal, then it's a zero. And so eventually what we do is we build these very, very large barcodes that, um, as I mentioned, far more than uniquely identify each of the different RNA molecules that you're profiling. Um, leaving extra bits for this error robustness that I mentioned earlier. And so by doing this, we actually get a map all the way from the tissue level down to the cellular level of whatever tissue type you're looking at. In, case, in this case, it's a mouse brain, but we can also do similar things. So here's just looking at eight genes in an ovarian cancer sample. And you can see you can zoom all the way down um, to the individual transcript level now, what this doesn't show is probably one of the most important aspects of doing this, which is tying those individual transcripts to a specific gene. And so this is where I mentioned that we do DAPI and cell boundary staining up front of the assay. What this allows us to do is not just identify the location of transcripts, but assign those to individual cells. So on the left, you can see a, a more zoomed out image. On the right, you can actually see that the cell boundaries um, defining each of the, the cell regions using a combination of um, DAPI for nuclear staining and then um, cell boundary stains to identify the, the outlines of the cells. And so this allows you to actually go all the way from tissue down to individual cell biology. So you can see on the right here, we're looking at specifically at just um, a couple of types of fibroblast cells. Um, you know, basically both of them express a coal 1A1, but key 67 um, is only expressed in the type two fibroblasts. And these are only a small number of, of the cell types that you can see in, in panel A um, that make up the, uh, the, the substance of the tissue. Um, so what you're looking at in A is a UMAP plot, and then B, C, and D are different resolutions of, of the uh, cellular data in, in space. And then down below in E, what you can see are the different cell markers or different, different RNA markers that define each of the different cell types. Now, looking at this in even a little bit more detail, just looking at the immune infiltrates in, in these samples, um, what you can see here is, for example, um, CD4, um, obviously very, very common um, you know, immune cell marker. So you can see that we have quite a few cells that express CD4. But then there's also other sets of cells that express CD4, but also express FOXP3, um, which is a, a, obviously a, a Treg T marker. So we can clearly differentiate CD4 positive Tregs from other CD4 positive cells. And if you look on the left in C and D, what you can see is, yes, there is some um, you know, differences in density of the immune infiltrate throughout the tumor, but you can see that there's very different patterns of Tregs versus um, more general CD4 positive cells. So in, um, in conclusion, um, I, I hope I've been able to show why um, MRFish and, and the MERScope platform has incredibly high sensitivity and flexibility. You know, the ability to avoid needing to do um, amplification in order to generate a sufficient signal um, the fact that we're using SM Fish technology, which is very robust and, and, and very simple. Um, the multiplexing power that we have by having this, this barcoding system where theoretically each, each additional bit you add increases your plex by twofold. Um, and the accuracy that we get from having done the um, such large barcodes that we have this error robustness. And of course, the resolution that comes from you know, both, again, not needing to do signal amplification, but also using world-class optics, like a 60X oil immersion lens. So with that, I will um, stop here and turn it over to the main speakers of the day. Um, again, I believe there's a Q&A um, button. If people have any questions, we're happy to take questions about any and all of the talks at the end of the presentations. Thank you.
Thanks, Paul, for the comprehensive overview of the MERSCO platform and the MERFISH technology. Our, spec our second speaker for today is Dr. Raymond Ip, who is a senior research officer at VHI with joint appointments across imaging, genomics, and the Hawkins Lab. His research focuses on studying my myeloma bone marrow microenvironment using spatial omics technologies. He leads the implementation of the Institute's Spatial Multiomics Initiative and supervises the operation of Australia's first MERSCO platform. He's heavily involved in technology benchmarking activities and has extensive collaborations with biotech companies. This talk is titled High Resolution Spatial Omics Analysis of Tissue Microenvironment Using MERSCO. So over to you, Ray. Thank you, Angela, for the very kind introductions and the opportunity to talk about our work um, in this webinar. So um, let me kind of like sort of brief outline of my talk. Um, so I'll mainly talk about what spatial mix really is and specifically focusing on the MERSCO platforms. And I'll present a glimpse of uh, some of the in-house data that we generated using, using the in-house MERSCO and also give you some perspectives on experimental design and also data analysis. So before I go to the science and um, kind of a brief introduction of who we are. So um, we are from the Walter and Elisa Hall Institute, um, which is Australia's oldest medical research institute located in Melbourne. And um, so we have over um, 1,300 staff and students across 90 different laboratories. So we are also located in the biomedical precinct where we concentrated with a lot of hospitals, cancer center, as well as university. So some of the major research areas at WeHi that we do include a, you know, a very um, expensive area of life sciences. So it includes development of biology, immunity, neuroscience, infectious disease, and importantly, oncology, which is the, the sort of the bread and butter of WeHi. And really, um, there's no need to introduce to this audience of how cancer is driven by not only cell intrinsic, but also importantly, extrinsic factor that come from the tissue microenvironments. And that's kind of the concept where tumor microenvironments is a key driver of cancer progression and importantly, a response to therapy. So there's a long standing code to identify new biomarkers and spatial signatures to improve patient diagnosis, prognosis. We can stratify patients and depending on the mutational status or even the tumor microenvironments so that to better match them with the most appropriate treatments. Um, so there are traditional methods to study tissue microenvironments. Um, as Paul really mentioned about, you know, there's imaging method um, that has a very high sensitivity. It maintained the tissue biology very well, but importantly, um, it, but unfortunately, it's only examining a relatively small number of biomarkers at one time. So maybe in the imaging world, we can look at maybe 12 or 10 markers at one single imaging run. But the downside is that usually imaging takes a long time. But on the flip side, um, a lot of people are very familiar with genomics, and um, especially in the era of single cell RNA sequencing, where it's extremely high throughput. So you can look at millions of cells in a relatively short time frame, And it also enables you to detect um, the entire transcription, for example, where you can have unbiased um, discovery power. But unfortunately, um, when you do single cell or bulk RNA-seq, you have to digest your tissue. So as soon as you digest the tissue, you're basically forgoing the spatial informations. And in some way, it, you might actually accidentally perturb the gene expression pattern. And notably, not every cell type, for example, like granular cell, they do not really survive tissue digestions. So in some way, you might get a sort of biased or skilled um, landscape of using genomics technology alone. And that's kind of where um, the hype comes from about spatial mix. It's that it's trying to be kind of a marriage in between both imaging and genomics world, where you can now not only digesting your tissue or imaging a small number of biomolecules, but you can look at hundreds of millions of biomolecules directly inside a tissue. And that was the reason why it was selected as the method of the year back in 2020. And so really kind of a histological and um, histologic and um, his logical landscape of the technology where it comes from bulk and single cell, you can see how rapidly um, spatial transcriptomics have arisen um, in the past few years. So I think this year it's kind of where we're hitting that subcellular spatial multiomics side of things where we're now not only looking at molecules at rather pixelated um, spatial resolution, but now we can actually measure 
um, those substances directly inside the tissue at single cell resolutions. So at WeHa, we are very fortunate to have uh, pretty good resources um, in investing in sequencing based as well as imaging based um, platforms. And um, so today I'm going to talk about our experience on the Meroscope platforms. So um, I think Paul did a really excellent introduction of how Meroscope work. And um, so we were very fortunate um, to receive the first Meroscope in Australia um, sort of late last year. Um, so essentially what Meroscope does is to image individual RNA molecule of hundreds of genes at that true single cell resolution. So you can start from the entire tissue and field of view, and then you can sort of zoom into that um, region of interest and then look at that molecule in that true cellless and um, spatial resolutions. And it has exceptional um, um, spatial resolution and also detection efficiency. And in terms of the basic chemistry, I think Paul really covered that very well. And so essentially it's just a, a multiplex uh, iterative cycles of the very traditional, traditional um, Thurston Institute hybridizations, where you basically hybridize a set of probes against your target of interest. And in order to read out the target, you would illuminate a subset of probes in each round. So not every probes will be imaged because of optical and um, crowding issues. So, and then you would repeat that um, imaging um, rounds for n number of rounds to determine that barcode. And then you can then decode the images to reveal the transcript identity. So with that approach, by repeating around eight rounds of imaging, you can image up to 500 genes. And in terms of our experience on the Meroscope, um, we have quite a huge amount of um, projects um, actively and um, ongoing at WeHi. So we have around 25 active projects, meaning that we're actually running the samples um, in a day-to-day -day basis. And in less than six months, um, we have performed over 80 experiments um, and importantly generate the hundreds of terabytes of data, which is a huge amount of data. And not only do we work for, um, or you know, work collaboratively with academic people, but we also work with pharmaceutical companies where we look at um, tissue microarrays and other type of sample as well. And we work on also highly diverse sort of projects beyond the human and mouse um, that look at breast cancer, can uh, brain cancer, COVID infections, and. Um, we also are working on other non-model organisms such as the marmosets and coral. And also, um, in addition to the standard um, tissue atlasing, we are actually also working on some novel application of Meroscope in looking at pathogen infections and look at how SARS-CoV-2 infect um, the lung. We are also using Meroscope to look at um, some lineage tracing molecules um, by designing probes that target the synthetic sequences and also some a bit of black like CRISPR activation screen. So all in all, it's a very flexible platform that we are um, finding it. And some of the in-house Meroscope data set that can be shown in here. So I've done a bit of um, breast tissue using a 500 gene panel that was custom designed by us. Then we've also generated um, a range of um, mouse and tissue and Meroscope data sets and both FFPE and frozen as well. So all this are generated in-house and, and we found it to be exceptionally satisfying to see all that really beautiful images. And kind of zooming in into one of the data set, which is a mouse spleen. So this is a kind of the data that you would get from the Meroscope platform. So in here, you can see some very canonical markers of T cell and B cells. And you can see how the B cells and T cells are spatially segregated in the spleen general center. It's just kind of the textbook biology. And essentially every dot that you see in these images are single molecule of that RNA and, and they're color coded and based on the gene identity. So you can see how beautifully the NGP and transcript is illuminating the neutrophil in this case, or the CD19 illuminating the B cells. So you can actually just by looking at where those are transcript are, you can outline the cell um, in your tissues. And again, beyond the tissue atlasing kind of projects, we have been trying to, you know, and um, be a little bit creative. So we have been using um, the gene this um, the gene panel design portal on the Vistran platform, um, where we were actually um, designing probes that bind to exogenous sequences. So in here, the cancer cells are being tagged with a molecular barcode that we can do lineage tracing. And so we design probes that bind into that different barcode 
and you can see how those um, cancer cells are being um, detected um, by those um, um, probes on the Mariscal platforms. And you can see how well the cell segmentation works in here. And you can see how, you know, basically it's a very heterogeneous um, clones of cancer cells in, in this tissue type. And again, you can see how individual RNA dots are being illuminated um, by the probes and kind of, again, um, demonstrating this that single molecule detection efficiency of the systems. And beyond those um, kind of like RNA profiling, we have also tried to do protein and RNA code detection on the microscope. So in here is a human brain tissue where we actually add the GFAP antibody um, to eliminate the astrocyte, I believe. Um, then we can overlay the RNA measurements and the protein measurement on the same tissue. And so again, um, this has been working very well and it doesn't really add too much of your time. Um, and it's actually quite essential in terms of cell segmentation that I'll talk about later on. So, um, so the other thing um, that we have been trying to do um, on the microscope is that we were not you know, satisfied with just doing normal tissue. We wanted to throw something very challenging to the systems and to kind of like test the limits. So um, what I wanted to tell you about, it's a very short story of how we're using the microscope platform to look at um, the, bone marrow, the bone marrow microenvironment. So um, one of my projects is actually looking at a blood and cancer disease called multiple myeloma, which is a um, blood and cancer malignancy caused by plasma cells expansion in the bone marrow. And despite decades of research, um, a cure remains elusive and relapse is also very common even after complete remissions. So there has been a very ongoing debate and hypothesis saying that the plasma cells, when they go to the bone marrow and they are under the influence of the microenvironments and so we have a very amazing team of um, uh, imaging and um, specialists in our team. And um, where basically, when you look at the movies of those um, myeloma cells compared to the leukemic cells, you can see how the leukemic cells are actually, you know, traveling across the bone marrow very freely. But in contrast, you can see how the myeloma cells are actually being locked inside the bone marrow, the bone marrow microenvironments. So that really um, makes us to hypothesize that is there a myeloma cell niche in the bone? And what are the cellular and molecular components that are controlling and communicating between the cancer cells and the bone marrow niche? And so this led us to try to develop a new a novel applications and to process bone tissue. So after months of optimization, um, we have developed a new method um, to cut unfixed non-decalcified fresh frozen bones. So essentially we collect the bone from the mouse, we snap frozen it, we cut it in the same day. And as you can see that, and we preserve the tissue morphology exceptionally well. And um, not only that, we can actually um, do HNG, you can see how that you know, cancer cell is located, where that cancer cell is located based on the HNG. And because we're not fixing it and we're not decalcifying it, we got exceptional tissue RNA quality. So essentially we you know, get some tissue section from the block, we got a perfect reading score of 10. And after we transfer it and put it onto the um, microscope site and we scrape it off from the microscope site, we still got a 9.3 reading score, which really speaks to the fact that the way that we are processing and cutting the bones are respecting the RNA integrity. So having successfully developed that method and to cut um, non-decalcified non bones, um, we decided to you know, give it a good go and, and then design a panel um, of 500 genes that based on single cell RNA seq of the bone marrow and also our in-house data sets. And um, we designed that gene list um, so that we can resolve almost every cell types or niches in the bone. And we also include genes that span across different um, lichen receptor signal pathway, WINT, hedgehog, BMP, IGF, and all that. And we also include genes that mark you know, proliferating cells um, or cell death, apoptosis, dormancy, and senescence, and all that. So this is a pretty comprehensive um, sort of tissue addressing panel um, specifically designed for the bone. And again, after many months of optimizations, um, I'm very pleased to say that we have successfully implemented that on the Marisco platform. So essentially what we did is that we cut one section onto a normal glass slide and we do confocal imaging to identify where the cancer cells are. And then we cut the next section onto the microscope side and then process it for um, imaging. And you can see that this is a sort of a super imp um, imposition of all that 
20 million transcripts um, onto the bone. And you can see how well those transcripts are distributed across the entire bone. So there's no gap and like the tissue integrity was maintained. And so we're very pleased with that. And again, because it is a single subcellular resolution map, so we can actually zoom into, you know, region of interest in here, for example, or we can zoom down into that single cell. And with the cell boundary staining, we can um, discriminate individual cells quite easily. So in here, you can see that this is a megakaryocyte and that extracts PF4, which is a very well-known transcript. And importantly, you can see how that TGF beta-1 transcript are concentrated and being pumped out by the megakaryocytes. So TGF beta-1 is a extremely potent um, immunosuppressive markers. So which is a very in interesting finding that may be telling us that megakaryocyte could be one of the main producers of, um, of immunosuppressive molecules. And also beyond that, um, for example, we are also seeing some very interesting um, gene expression pattern. For example, in here, we discovered that one of the genes in our panel, it expressed in a very clone specific way. So you can see how that, you know, um, how that um, CFP um, expressing clone do not express that gene, whereas the RP um, myeloma clone, they highly express that genes. So it suggests that maybe the, um, even that they are driven by the same oncogenic genes, the myeloma cells, they might remodel their tissue microenvironments in a very local and also very specific way. That might explain why and some treatment do not work well for some patients. So um, all in all, like we found it to be very satisfying and have generated very beautiful data set for such a challenging tissue type. And at the end, I wanted to kind of like give you some user insight on how the platform behaves. So I think one of the main challenges um, about Meriscope data set or in general spatial data set, it's about the size of the data. So this is a kind of a very um, rough sketch of how our data storage um, happened at WeHide. So it's not very up to date, but you can see how spatial data and mainly Meriscope is kind of like catching up on light sheets and confocal data because it generates over five terabytes of raw data per run. So you need to think about how you're going to manage and store that data. And something that it's quite unique um, um, about spatial data, it's about background noise. So in here, we're, we're looking at two different molecules in here. So on the left, you can see there are some green molecules that are scattered throughout the entire tissue. But then on the right, you can see how that blue molecule are concentrated in that particular spot of the tissue. And interestingly, they are both blank barcode. So meaning that they're actually background noise in your data sets. So meaning that in your spatial data set, when you want to do normalization, batch corrections, you have to look at those noise in two dimensions. So you need to understand the number of that, you know, that's a, you know, the quantity of those noise, but also the spatial location of that noise would also affect on how you interpret the data. So maybe there was some imaging errors, there may be some tissue folding in that particular area that caused such a local um, background noise. And then you have to think about how do you remove the noise? How do you normalize the, um, that data set in that particular area? And one central thing about um, analysis of imaging-based data, it's cell segmentations. So as you can see on the left in here, there are two DAPI positive cells that are being classified as a single cell by the software. So it's kind of a doublet um, in your single cell RNA seq. So if you incorrectly segment cells, it can lead to transcript spillover where the transcript from one cell can bleed into the transcript into of the other cell that create kind of a hybrid cell type. And that will really screw up your cell phenotyping analysis. And a good thing about the Meriscope system is that the cell boundary setting has worked exceptionally well um, for most tissue types. So in here you can see how you know, that piece itself, you can kind of readily identify the cells, but with the cell boundary thing, you can now identify individual um, cells very nicely, and you can see where the boundary ends, and then you can assign the transcript back to the appropriate cells. And that gives you higher confidence in calling this um, sort of cell to cell um, variations. And this is what we also have been doing in-house as well, where we, um, in addition to, um, 
using the MERSC of default self segmentation, we are also doing our own bespoke self segmentation and with the help of the bio image analysis score at WeHi. So you can see how, um, you know, there's a lot of like doublet cells being called by the MERSC, but after training and custom self segmentation, those doublet can be, can be resolved. And this is exactly what we do on the microscope and data set on the bone. Again, you can see how the cell segmentation really, um, you know, doesn't work really well on the bone data. It's such a challenging tissue type. But after custom training um, and cell segmentation model, then we can actually identify individual cell types. And this kind of like how the clustering analysis looks like. And all this can be done using the BISGEN post-processing pipeline. And that is quite help helpful. So um, in conclusion, I think um, you know, spatial omics, it's such an exceptional opportunity for us to look at tissue biology with unprecedented details and positions. And we have been finding most of the produce exceptional data quality, and it's highly flexible. So we've done it on um, not only on very standard tissue, but on challenging tissues such as the bone. We've done it on looking at exogenous transcript and also other species as well. And also importantly, um, it has a very transparent data acquisition and analysis pipeline. And it's the only platform that keeps every piece of raw data. And so, you know, you never know when those raw data would come in handy. Maybe there's one day if there's a improvement in decoding analysis pipeline that might improve your data. And I think importantly is that um, we're finding that the, the data analysis is probably the most important um, aspect of analyze and on, on of the MERSC data sets. And, so that's why I think data analysis is actually more important than wet lab researchers. So just wanted to thank everyone at WeHi that contribute to the um, um, Merskop data set um, and happy to take any questions afterwards. Thanks, Ray, for that interesting presentation on the bone marrow tumor microenvironment. I see there are quite a few questions getting popped up into our Q&A panel. We will definitely go through as many questions we can at the end during our Q&A panel, that's joint session. Our final speaker for today is Dr. Hong Yun Choi, who is an associate professor at Seoul National University Hospital and is also the co-founder and chief technology officer for Portray Inc. His research primarily revolves around leveraging artificial intelligence in medical imaging and molecular medicine. He integrates diverse biological and medical data to discover biomarkers and disease targets as a translational study. He combines spatial transcriptomics with AI to initiate new theranostics and to develop novel biomarkers. He has received several accolades for his work, including the Hamchun Academic Award and the Innovator Under 35 Award from MIT Technology Review Korea. The title for his presentation today is Understanding the Tumor Microenvironment and Clinical Applications Through Integrated Spatial Transcriptomics and Imaging. Over to you, Dr. Choi. Okay, thank you for your nice introduction. Uh, okay, so my, back, my, my background is a nuclear medicine physician who deals with uh, molecular imaging in the clinical field. So today I'm going to talk about how can we use this emerging technology, MERSCOP and spatial transcriptomics for cl clinical translation by integrating with the imaging. Uh, so far, our many integrative algorithms uh, for integrating spatial transcriptomics and imaging uh, have been developed uh, for the barcode-based method but recently, we're actively using MERSCOP platform to apply and upgrade these algorithms with the high resolution. So today, I'm going to discuss these things uh, with many uh, people. OK, so uh, as a translational researcher, we can start from the surgical tissues or very valuable tissues obtained from the human disease samples. Then why we want to investigate this kind of these tissue is that to know, understand, the pathophysiology, or sometimes we want to find the target for the diagnosis or therapeutics. And two, uh, what we want to know from this TG tissue is the many molecules, as many as possible, uh, with a high resolution. And if we can cover the larger field, then it can be more useful. So we can start from the clinic, and we can collect the data. And in the bench side, we can find uh, very noble findings or clues for the pathophysiology or for the new target for the therapeutics or diagnostics. So this is a translational research platform. However, recently, the data size uh, right now are much, much bigger than before. 
nowadays, uh, for example, for the Morse data, uh, as pr a previous speaker mentioned, it reaches more than five terabytes per sample. So we need very good computer algorithm. So we need another uh, method to, to develop this kind of diagnostic or therapeutic target or to investigate the pathophysiology using this kind of Morse data. <clears throat> so this is because of the evolution of the molecular information. So previous uh, algorithms such as NGS technology can provide all the gene expression data. However, it cannot reach the a single cell level. However, recently, uh, single cell RNA sequencing is very popular and it is widely used in many papers. And it, nowadays it moved to the spatial transcriptomics. And barcode-based methods, for example, 10 x visium are, are are uh, firstly commercialized, and nowadays uh, another version, image-based spatial transcriptomics represented by MERSCOP, can provide subcellular resolution with uh, sub uh, three-dimensional data and more genes panels. So it can be very powerful method to understand the pathophysiology from the digital tissue. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of the uh, landscape of the molecular information, the MERS-CoV system or other kinds of spatial transcriptomics located in, in this axis, it means it shows very high resolution and it can provide many information from the number of the uh, many number of the molecular target. However, in the clinical field, we just use HNE or immunosystem chemistry. It just cover very a few molecular targets, and for the in vivo imaging such as PET, MRI, or SPECT, it covers just a few molecular targets with a low resolution. However, it is covered by the clinic. However, a spatial transcriptomics itself cannot cover in the clinic. So as a translational researcher, we can discover the key target from the spatial transcriptomics, and we can translate to the clinical imaging by integrating the information of the spatial transcriptomics and imaging. So as a clinical researcher, many researchers use uses this kind of uh, imaging data to understand the pathophysiology or some uh, disease features uh, using the data. However, in the uh, bench side, many uh, translational researchers use this kind of molecular information. However, we cannot integrate them directly because they have different scales. However, spatial transcriptomics, one of the great meaning is that they can uh, bridge the gap between these two scales because spatial transcriptomics can both uh, provide both the information for the molecular level chains and gross level chains uh, using the space information. So one of the key points of the spatial transcriptomics is integrating with the imaging. So this is one of my first approach that uh, the integration between the imaging and transcriptomic data. And one of my uh, question in the clinical field is that the variety, variety of the cancer. For example, this is a lung cancer PET imaging. Uh, this can provide the molecular information, glucose metabolism information of the tumor. And according to my, my clinical experience, the FTZ patterns are very, very uh, heterogeneous. So I wonder why this kind of glucose metabolism of the tumors are heterogeneous. So we, uh, we underwent the uh, transcriptomic analysis and some part from some correlative analysis between them. And we successfully found that this glucose metabolism in the tumor microenvironment depends on the glucose transport 3 mediated by the immune cells. And for the cold tumors, immune uh, cold tumors, they, uh, the glucose metabolism is depends on the glucose 1 mediated cancer cell uptake. However, according to this analysis, we, we, we cannot perform some in-depth validation because of the problem of the scale. Because the glucose metabolism is measured by the gross level scale tumor. However, the transcriptomic analysis uh, based on the bulk rna seq is just obtained from a very small area of the uh, tumor tissues. So the, in the in terms of scale, we cannot integrate the spatial uh, the transcriptomic analysis and imaging directly. However, spatial transcriptomics can provide the opportunity to integrate this transcriptomic analysis and imaging directly. For example, this is a X vivo uh, red autoradiography imaging, uh, which is the same version of this PET imaging. And then we can identify the heterogeneity patterns of the glucose metabolism or some proliferation index as a, a functional term of the tumor. And we can get some spatial transcriptomics directly, and then we can perform some collative analysis. So by, by analyzing as a spatial manner that we can identify why this tumor shows hyper metabolism in here and why this tumor shows very low metabolism in here. So uh, by integrating the spatial transcriptomics and uh, this kind of imaging, then we can get a lot of information of the underlying biology of the spastic imaging. 
And for the clinical translation, we can discover the key target from the spatial transcriptome data. We can identify the key molecular patterns or some key targets uh, in the tumor tissues. And if we find the ligand specifically bound to the specific target, then we can translate into the clinical level imaging, such as a path. So this integration is very innovative in terms of the molecular imaging field. So one of the uh, one of our first approach to integrate the spatial transcriptomics with the imaging was a SPAID, which is an algorithm that spatial expression patterns identified by deep learning of the tissue images. So first version we just used the HNE imaging uh, integrate with the spatial transcriptomics based on the barcode based method, and. Well, we uh, acquire some uh, image features from the deep learning algorithms, predefined deep learning algorithms. And th this kind of algorithm can provide the features, uh, uh, some quantitative features of the patches. And these quantitative features can be correlated with the uh, spatial gene expression patterns. Then it, gen, gen, this gene expression can explain the structural information or imaging features directly. And this is uh, one of the algorithms. And according to our analysis, the genes extracted by the image features, then it can, uh, it can divide the tumor regions very accurately, according to our analysis. And we, uh, we moved to another version of the imaging, imaging integration. For example, uh, the microscopic level drug distribution analysis with the spatial transcriptomics. For example, for if, if we develop some antibody drug conjugate or other types of antibody drugs, then these antibodies are not uh, directly accumulated in the tumor antigen. For example, this is an EGFR expression in the tumor. However, if we develop some EGFR targeting antibody, and if we administer this kind of antibody to the in vivo, then this, the distribution of antibody is somewhat different from the EGFR tumor antigen, because these kinds of antibody drugs are are, are affected by many tumor microenvironment factors, such as hypoxia or tumor vasculature or some tumor pressure. So that's why we want to integrate this kind of drug distribution map with the spatial transcriptomics. So we labeled uh, some specific drugs with the fluorescence, and we get some drug distribution map with the fluorescence imaging. And we integrate this imaging with the spatial transcriptomics, and we can uh, uh, investigate why these drugs are located in the tumor core in here, and why these drugs are located in the center of the tumor. So this tumor, the the, the accumulation of this drug was associated with the hypoxia or glycolysis patterns. So we can successfully use this kind of algorithms to understand the drug distribution in the real tumor tissue. And this is another version uh, collaborate with another biotech companies and they develop some drug carrier uh, which can be labeled with some targeting motifs and they want to develop some the drug targeting the tumor associated macrophages. And their first version was located in here after the in, in, in vivo administration of the drugs to the tumor. And another version of the drug are, are highly accumulated in another part. And this part was associated with the cancer cells and the targeting motif one uh, labeled drugs are, are located in here. And it was associated with the tumor associated macrophages. So they could successfully choose this targeting motif one for targeting the tumor associated macrophages. And recently we moved to the merck data uh, to integrate with this kind of drug distribution map based on the cell therapy or antibodies or nanoparticles. And recently, we, uh, we tried to obtain this kind of integration with the MERSC of data with the drug distribution map. And we believe that we can, express, we can expect the detailed integration of the drug distribution uh, under the subcellular level in the future. And another Another uh, another clinical translational point of the uh, MERSCOP is uh, analysis for the drug mechanism of action or to understand the pathophysiology with the clinical information. And this is one of the study for the preclinical research targeting the tumor immune microenvironment. Uh, one of our collaborator, collaborator found that a specific target can modulate the tumor microenvironment according to their single cell RNA sequencing data. And they perform some kind of preclinical study uh, with uh, four different groups. They uh, found some noble target inhibitor, and one group was treated with the noble target inhibitor, and another group is vehicle, and another group is uh, treated with, with anti-PD-1, and another group is anti-PD-1 combined with noble target inhibitor. And they successfully found that this noble target inhibitor shows very good list, uh, good uh, treatment efficacy for the tumor, uh, for the tumor, and they found that some synergistic effect uh, of the anti-PD-1 and noble target inhibitor. 
So they want to know the mechanism of action of neural target inhibitor in terms of the tumor microenvironment when they combine with anti-PD-1. <clears throat> so we use the MERSCOP system uh, with the tissue microarray uh, data. And in the tissue microarray data, we can uh, put the, uh, all the samples in the just one slide, and we can analyze these things with the one battery. So it can uh, minimize the battery effect, and this is very effective because we can uh, understand that all the tumor microenvironment features according to the treatment. So uh, we recently developed some full service workflow to analyze this kind of preclinical mechanism of action of the drug uh, using this uh, combined with a TMA with the MERSCOP system. By integrating them, we performed some automatic segmentation uh, using the tissue microarray data, and we, on, we developed another AA uh, algorithms for the cell mapping, and we successfully identified the patterns of the uh, uh, tumor microenvironment cell types according to treatment. And we found that decreased cough when we use the new drugs successfully. So this is a very uh, automatic system, so we can identify the key biomarkers related to the new drugs, and what tumor microenvironment cell types affect the efficacy, particularly this kind of new target inhibitor. And uh, furthermore, we can, uh, we can use another analysis, such as spatial relationship between the tumor cells and other tumor microenvironment cells. And this is another clinical translational study. We collected many uh, tumor sample, samples from the lung cancer, and one of the big questions is that the changes of the tumor microenvironment according to tumor growth. For example, the, for the lung cancer, tumor size is a key factor associated with the prognosis, and this, the tumor growth can be affect the tumor microenvironment features. So clinically, tumor size is a key factor in terms of the tumor uh, prognosis and the treatment uh, a choice. So we want to know the association between the tumor microenvironment patterns and the tumor growth. So we collected around uh, 20 samples from the lung squamous carcinoma, uh, collaborate with the uh, thoracic surgeon, and generate the tissue microarray block, and we perform some burst analysis. And by the removing this kind of batch effect, and we successfully uh, map the all the cell map using the UMAP, and we uh, use some AI algorithm for the cell mapping, like this one. And we can identify the all the cell types according to tumor core, like this one. And this is a cell markers according to tumor cores. And we successfully uh, we found that our cell mapping algorithms are working. And the cellular uh, map uh, tumor microenvironment cell types proportions are varied according to the uh, 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 lung squamous carcinoma. And by analyzing many things, first one is a tumor proportion uh, in the tumor microenvironment. And we can identify the spatial relationship between the cancer epithelium and other tumor microenvironment cell types. And according to our analysis, we found that tumor size was correlated with the epithelial and myeloid cell neighborhood needs. So tumor growth can be associated with the spatial infiltration patterns of a myeloid cell. So it is not simply related to proportion of the tumor microenvironment cell. And according to analysis, uh, tumor growth can be associated with the adjacent pattern of the tumor microenvironment cells. It means previous studies such as single cell RNA sequencing cannot identify this kind of spatial patterns so MERSCOP can provide another opportunity to analyze this kind of spatial adjusted pattern of the tumor microenvironment. Okay, so and another translational point is uh, imaging uh, and uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm for the spatial transcriptomics analysis. One of the big trends in the tumor microenvironment targeting drug is uh, 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 the uses of the biomarker, pre-selection biomarker. For example, previous clinical trial without the biomarker, then the response rate will be decreased. However, if we use the selection biomarker, patient selection biomarker, then the response rate will be remarkably increased. So that's why many uh, biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies want to use the pre-selection biomarker. And many uh, drugs targeting the tumor microenvironment, they want to need to know about the tumor microenvironment cell type patterns in the real world tumors. And one of the good uh, biomarker is the immunized chemistry. However, it just provides just one or two uh, molecular information uh, in, with the space information. And if we, if we can use the direct uses of the spatial transcriptomics uh, in the clinical samples, however, it, 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 can, it can be very useful for the discovery of the biomarker. However, it is difficult to use in the real world clinic because it is too extensive and the quality control is very difficult to directly use in the clinic. However, 
But if we combine this kind of direct uses of spatial transcriptomics and clinically conventional imaging techniques, then we can predict many things uh, with the AI, when you combine with the clinical imaging and spatial transcriptomics. So our one of the strategy is to uh, collect a lot of database uh, using the spatial transcriptomics and perform some cell time mapping using the artificial intelligence and combined with the HNE images, then we can develop another version of AI to predict the cell time maps only using the HNE images. And HNE images is widely used in the real world hospital, so it can be easily accessible. So uh, we believe that AI combined with the HNE images can uh, provide another spatial bios information in the real world clinic. So this is first version of the cell mapping AI algorithms. Uh, recently, we moved to the image-based spatial transcriptomics for the cell time mapping. And we collect a lot of data for the HNE and spatial transcriptomics and train this HNE image patterns to uh, predict the cell types, uh, which is labeled with the spatial transcriptomics. And we firstly collect a lot of lung cancer samples, and we successfully found that the cell type maps only using the HNE images was well collated with the uh, image chemistry. And this kind of algorithms are recently we moved to the uh, software, and this is uh, one of the version of RCC data. And you can see in here, when you choose the specific cell types, and they can provide some AI-based uh, prediction cell type, pro cell type proportion map like this one. And however, there are some limitations uh, in terms of the resolution. So recently we moved to the, another version of this kind of AI algorithm using the MERSCOP system. So we collect many, we, we, we have collected a lot of clinical samples and we collect MERSCOP data with the HNE images. And by the registr registration between the MERSCOP data and HNE images, then we can train this kind of algorithms with a high resolution. So this is a, a very initial version of the AI algorithm that cellular mapped by the MERS-CoV for the cancer epithelium. And after training using the AI algorithms, then it can provide very uh, accurate information for the uh, cancer cell mapping. If more, it can provide some mapping for the tum uh, tumor microenvironment cell types. And for the clinical researches, uh, this is one of our research that when we use this kind of AI algorithm for the surgical cohort who treated with the immune oncology after the recurrence, and we found that some kinds of cell type enrichment score was well correlated with the response to the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Okay, so lastly, I'd like to share some ideas of the spatial transcriptomic analysis for the spatial topology, because spatial transcript one of the advantages of spatial transcriptomics is that is that it can provide uh, some spatial relationship between the cell types or receptor ligand. So we developed some stopover algorithm, which is a topological overlap analysis for the cell-to-cell -cell interaction or receptor ligand interaction, uh, regardless of the spatial transcriptomics platform. So this is based on the spatial topological patterns uh, between two different types of cells, and it can success it can calculate the co-localized patterns uh, mapped with the uh, HNE images or spatial transcriptomic data. And when we use this kind of spatial overlap patterns, we have found that some different types of the tumors shows very different spatial overlap patterns when we use the spatial transcriptomic analysis. For example, this is a PDR1 zero percent lung cancer tumor, and they they shows that the lung cancer epithelium is not overlapped with the uh, uh, tumor microenvironment cell types. However, another lung adenocarcinoma patient who shows PDR1 100%, and they shows very uh, overlap patterns between the uh, tumor cells and some myeloid cells or lymphocyte like this one. And recently, we uh, apply this algorithm to the MERSCOP data. This is a breast cancer data uh, obtained by the Mer uh, VZEN. And we use this algorithm to identify the overlap patterns between the cells or some uh, receptor ligand. And we successfully found that for these tumors, the tumor cell, cancer cells are overlapped with the B cells mostly, and followed by the T cells. And cough is uh, not overlapped with the cancer cells, according to this data. And we successfully identified the localized patterns of the receptor ligand interaction. And this green color means the uh, receptor ligand interaction between the PD1 and PDR1. And we can uh, data-driven analysis for the top receptor ligand pair uh, with the spatial overlap patterns uh, with the uh, receptor ligand database. 
And finally, I'd like to discuss some idea of the spatial transcriptomics are ultimately contribute to the patient's treatment. Is that we believe that spatial transcriptomics is the very big size data. So it can be very informative for the clinical samples. Uh, if we want to use, if we want to perform some kind of translation or study, then it can start from the very small size samples. And spatial transcriptomics can provide a lot of information from just one uh, one square centimeter uh, samples. And Morskop data uh, reaches around one uh, more than one terabyte data, so it can provide a lot of information from the small size sample. So using this uh, this kind of data, we believe that it is a good starting point to transforming the drug development because we can choose the best target from the data. And another another good point of the spatial transcriptomics is that we can uh, find some opportunity to transform the precision medicine by developing the biomarker, for example, AI-based biomarker by integrating the imaging with the spatial transcriptomic data. So we recently collected a lot of spatial transcriptomic samples, uh, including the MERSCO prefer uh, for around uh, 500 patients uh, from the six cancer types. And uh, in the next year, we aim at collect more than 150, uh, uh, 100, 500 patients uh, from the eight cancer types, including the MERSCO data. So uh, we believe that patients drive data are starting point of the new drug, new drug development or new treatment strategy, and this is a, a critical point of the translational research. So uh, when we use the, this kind of clinically originated samples, then it can change the landscape of the drug development pathways. So when we use the MERSCOP data in, as a clinical translational study, then we can find many things by the in silico, by the computer, and we can validate in vitro and vivo rapidly. And we, we believe that we can move to the clinical trial very successfully and very rapidly. So in summary, uh, the integration with the imaging and imaging analysis of the spatial transcriptomics is a very new opportunity to find the new information of the drug distribution or drug mechanism of action. And AI a combi a imaging combined with a spatial transcriptomics by the AI, then it can provide another opportunity to develop some new imaging-based biomarker and new analytic workflow. And finally, one of the great advantages of the spatial transcriptomics and spatial biology is the spatial patterns between the cells or some molecules. So we believe that this kind of topological analysis or some spatial analysis for the tumor microenvironment can provide another new information uh, to understand the tumor pathology or tumor microenvironment. So all the studies are underwritten by the Seoul Regional University Hospital, and my co-founded company, uh, Portray, uh, contributes to this, to this kind of MERSCOP data and analysis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Hong Yoon, for that really fascinating talk and you know trying to see how you can take spatial data especially generated from MERSCOPE all the way to the clinic uh, really interesting uh, so now we'll go ahead with the Q&A panel so maybe I'll have I have a list of questions that I will ask uh, to each speaker as and when the questions come in so I think the first question is for Ray uh, so hi Raymond fantastic and very impressive work on a technical note what is the sort of scan slash runtime for a fresh frozen femur, assuming about 500 genes? So I think the scanning time for 500 genes um, for around you know, 70 millimeters square of tissue would take around 33 to 36 hours. Um, I think it's actually quite fast um, and it's quite consistent as well. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ray. Uh, so we have a question for Paul. Uh, what do we typically use as a cell boundary stain in a MERSCOPE experiment? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. We actually have a cocktail that combines multiple cell boundary stains into um, a, a single analyte. Um, the exact contents are proprietary, but I also want to mention that if people have their own specific ones, um, that should be doable too. Um, I know that there was a, a question about one specific one that I hadn't seen before in, in the Q&A also. Um, I'm going to look into that and get the answer back to them, but um, it is flexible. So if you have um, a unique tissue that requires very specific cell boundary stains, it, you, you certainly can customize your own in addition to using the cocktail that we provide. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so we have a call. Uh, we have a question for Hong Yoon. A fantastic presentation. Has there been any analysis performed with Mersco on spheroids or organoid tissue? 
Yeah, actually, I, I have no experiences to use spheroid or organoid. However, we believe that the spheroid and Merskop can be covered by Merskop because it is very flexible. And this is very informative because spheroid or Mers uh, some uh, organoid system can be placed uh, many organoid or spheroid on the same uh, slide. So it, the, the batch effect can be reduced and it is very high sort of uh, uh, experiment can be possible. Kong Yoon, I have one more question. Are you looking at other disease model other than cancer, for example, development of the brain environment when you're studying clinical applications for spatial technology? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, one of our uh, research interests is a brain disorder and brain is another, another uh, good uh, candidate for the spatial transcriptomics. And recently, we uh, performed many uh, Alzheimer's disease model to uh, find some key molecular patterns associated with the uh, key pathophysiology, such as amyloid beta or tau propagation. And the, the Merskov system can provide very high resolution images. So we can identify some, uh, uh, some immune cells associated with the tau patterns uh, in, in the spatial manner. So it is very informative and very uh, it can provide very new information regarding the neurodegenerative disorder. Thanks, Hong Yoon. Uh, so, Ray, question for you. Great stuff. How do you cut fresh frozen bone? Is there any specialized temperature or blade? I'm combining a few different questions because this was something, a recurrent theme in the Q&A. Yeah, I think like um, we are on the verge of publishing the data and also the protocol as well. So very happy and um, sort of, you know, um, send me emails about you know collaboration opportunities and all that so it should be out hopefully soon great thanks ray um so there's another question for you ray have you tried uh, cutting old snap frozen samples how is the rna quality of the bone um i think it, it's doable i think the most important part is actually during tissue collection so if you sort of collect the tissue without damaging um, the tissue and you use clean tools and all that and that's probably more important than the the durations of how how long it has been stored in the freezer um this is a question for hong yun uh how do you design your tme gene panel is there a strategy uh, there for your design yeah okay uh we uh, we designed some uh, immuno oncology panel uh which was firstly designed by the vsan great thanks hong yun um, Can we maybe ask that same question of Raymond also? Um, obviously, you've got some you know fairly unique samples. How, how do you go about designing a gene panel for this? Because I believe most of what you've been doing is is custom work. Yeah, so basically every project that we've been running were custom designed panels. So it is actually kind of relatively easy. <laughs> and so I think like most of people come to use imaging-based platforms. They have a very you know, and discrete questions that they want to answer. So they often have a favorite gene list. And it's, and again, like the gene design and the gene panel design portal, it's very intuitive to use. And so very often it takes us, you know, less than one or two days to really get the first draft. And so in terms of designing probes against exogenous sequences, and then we actually would engage with the VisGen informatic team to make sure that there's no mishabilizations or cross hybridization between the probes and all that. So um, it's it's actually re relatively easy. Thanks, Ray. Uh, so we have another question for you. Do you get similar com conclusions when comparing the same tissue across different formats, frozen versus FFPE, using MERSCO? Um, I think we're actually doing some something very similar, which we actually benchmark different tissue as well between different storage conditions and all that. But I think most important, it's actually kind of like the DV200 score or the reading score of your tissue types. Um, if you have a pretty high score, um, then you should be expected to get some comparable data. Right. Um, there's also a question around accuracy of cell segmentation. Uh, Protein-based spatial analysis is difficult sometimes to distinguish neighboring cells. Um, I think in our experience, um, the cell boundary stain has been working very well um, across most tissue, um, especially especially on epithelial tissue. It you know works extremely well on lung and ovarian breast tissues. But in a case where it doesn't really work well, then we actually that's kind of the reason why we do custom cell segmentation, which we combine 
all the free channels for the cell boundary staining. And also that's kind of the reason why we do bespoke um, protein code detection as well, that it's quite critical in terms of cell segmentations. Maybe I can add something to that as well. So, I mean, cell segmentation is really complicated. And it's probably the most challenging part, I think, of, of a lot of this, because a lot of your downstream work, um, you know, where you're looking at cell types and things like that falls apart if you can't actually differentiate the cells. And so one of the things we've tried to do is make the platform as flexible as possible. So in, in the latest version of what we call our, our post-processing tool, we've implemented a plug-in architecture, which not only allows you to, um, you know, put in multiple sort of pre-canned algorithms if you want to. But for example, if you're using something like CellPost 2, where you can use a, a, a you know, person in the middle training algorithm, where you sort of iteratively train and revise, you know, the, the segmentation um, and then reprocess that. And you do that a, a handful of times and you actually get something that, that looks for the types of cells that you have in your tissue. That can actually help quite a bit. But, but Raymond, you're right. I mean, if, if there's not a good cell boundary stain, it, it does get a lot more complicated. So I don't want to diminish that. But, but I think we, we've probably got the most flexible um, segmentation pipeline in, in the market right now. I mean, obviously, this will all change, will evolve, others will evolve. But mm -hmm. I, we've had really good success, even with some you know, complicated samples. And I think there was a webinar recently with someone looking at um, cardiac cells. And, and there you have huge differences in sizes of, of cells between um, some of the cardiac cells and some of the, the um, you know, immune cells and, and support cells. But also you have this problem where a, a significant portion of the cardiac cells are actually um, non-nucleated. So, you know, if you try and rely on DAPI as, you know, part of the identification, that, that all kind of falls apart. And so, you know, we've been quite successful, or I should say our, our users have been quite successful. Um, you know, in developing strategies to do segmentation, even with complicated samples. Yeah, I think some some types of tumors, the uh, the basic cell segmentation algorithms are rejecting very good, very good uh, result. However, some uh, kinds of uh, tissues, like very dense tissues, or some uh, kinds of uh, preclinical studies using the genograft model. So cell segmentation algorithms are very difficult and it's, it's not easy. So it seems that uh, we need to check the data in detail uh, with the uh, explorer and then pick the appropriate method. In some cases, uh, we sometimes use uh, create this grid-like structure instead of the cell direct segmentation and we can measure some cell density. And some types of types of some customized algorithms can provide the cell segmentation with the cell labeling with only the RNA without DAP imaging, and they are sometimes very successful. So we can choose appropriate method according to the analysis types or the tissue types. Anya, may, may I ask a question? Um, yeah, I'm I'm really curious. I mean, you you you've developed a huge amount of data and a huge amount of insights that have clinical relevance. How does that translate to the clinic, right? I mean, it's it's a huge amount of data. It's 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 a big process. I mean, do, do you have a feel for what a clinical assay might look like? Is that high flex gene expression combined with H and E, or um, you know, is it is it actually a much simpler assay that falls out from having done so much discovery work, or or is it too early to tell? Yeah, so you you mean some difficulties uh, to collect the clinical samples or to analyze the all the clinical samples? I guess I'm trying to think of, of, of what's the next step. You know, if you want, if this is to uh -huh. become a widely used clinical assay, do you, do you have any feel for what that might look like, or is it a little too early? Yeah, I I think uh, this this data is a starting point to develop some very noble, uh, noble target drugs. So it can provide many information, molecular information from the clinical data, and we don't need to start from the uh, some uh, kind of experiment. Uh, we can start from the clinical samples directly. So we can identify the molecular expression patterns in the tumor core or tumor periphery, and uh, they are the sense patterns between the tumor microenvironment cells. So we can uh, very easily choose the best target from the data. And another version is the uh, clinical translation translationable methods, such as AI algorithm combined with the EMZ and spatial transcriptomics for the AI-based biomarker development. So I think this kind of collecting this kind of data is a very good starting point to develop some biomarkers or some target discovery for the uh, many pharmaceutical companies. And this data is very valuable and it's very cost effective compared with uh, immunosist chemistry, conventional immunosist chemistry or other kinds of conventional tools. Great, thank you.
Ray, I think we're getting more questions on the decalcification protocol. So you did mention that your uh, publication is coming out soon. Is it like a preprint or will it be at a particular, uh, is there any information we can give to the audience who are interested in understanding the protocol? Yeah, so I think we'll sort of like describe the, the protocol in details in the publication. So I don't think it'll be in the preprint. Um, but again, like it's, it's something that I hope it's, you know, everyone can implement in the lab. And again, like very happy to discuss offline and about collaboration opportunities. Absolutely. And I think once the preprint is out or the publication's out, we will make sure that we distribute it to the uh, to all our um, subscribers as well. Um, so Ray, there's another question for you. Why did you choose Fresh Frozen instead of FFPE? So it's actually kind of, first of all, like um, we know that FFPE and tends to give poor um, RNA quality um, and importantly, um, it has higher autofluorescence um, compared to frozen tissues. And also historically, um, we have done it on other spatial transatomic platform. And at the time, we could only do it on fresh frozen tissues. And so that's kind of the reason why um, we, have, we have basically generated multimodal data on the fresh frozen bones. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that's all of the Q&A that we have in the chat. Um, so maybe I'll just wait for a minute or two to see if there's any more questions popping up. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to thank everyone for joining the webinar today and a big special thanks to our presenters for presenting such exciting work uh, and their research today. I really appreciate all your time and effort. Um, and I think there's no more questions. So uh, again, thank you once again for joining. Uh, recording of this webinar much. will be a recording of the webinar will be made available to all those who registered. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at vision.com. And we can uh, definitely uh, provide uh, responses to any other questions that might not have come up or uh, had time to answer for today. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Rehon. Thank you. Thank you very much.